message was easy for me to prepare because we, for our VBS, did the seven C's. Now, not the C's that you float in, but the seven C's, which are what, kids? Do you know what they are? Creation, corruption, catastrophe, confusion, Christ, cross, and consummation. Very good. They did a good job on that. Out of all the worldviews that are presented, Christianity has one of the greatest hurdles. And why is it Christianity has the greatest hurdle? It's because the devil does not want people to hear the Christian faith. So the way I looked at it always was, if you have one door, which is Jesus Christ, it's easy. There's only one door to go in and out. So the devil uh, works his while so that there are many hundreds of doors to look at and to go in and out of. So that causes great confusion. And if we look at the media, we see that the media takes little interest in people who are hypocrites and people who do wrong things with, say, Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, or evolutionism. It is always Christianity that's under the microscope. Uh, no matter what we do, we never tend to make people uh, accepting or happy with us. We're always colored with intolerance. Always we are. Buddhists can be intolerant. In fact, you go to other countries where Hinduism and Buddhism and other ones are fighting and at war with another. We never hear about that. It's only when Christianity seems to take the wrong step do we get into problems. So we're colored with intolerance, bigotry, and we're considered out of, out of touch with our culture. We're supposed to remain quiet. Remember when one of our former presidents, he was accused of doing something wrong, and they'd always come and say, well, that's his private life. Well, you cannot privatize a Christian life. You can't leave it at home when you go to work, and we certainly don't leave it at home when we come to church. Many worldviews and many opinions, but you know there's only one that's true. And they say, well, you Christians are too exclusive. Because it's the truth. Jesus is the only way to the Father in heaven. There is no other way. Uh, Christianity is based upon the understanding that since God is the creator, he is the authority over his creation. The problem is that mankind has decided we're going to do things our own way. That's where we start with the seven C's. Uh, the problem with discussing the Christian worldview versus evolution is that there's always the debate well your Christianity is based on myths from an old book from an old culture way back but we can also look at evolution and say it is a theory and more than enough times that theory has been proven wrong but they'll never come back and say well I guess you guys were right on the established facts that we have so the problem with Christianity is it is one view among so many. The problem with comparative religion is that uh, are we willing to give God the valid and deserved recognition that he deserves? We don't. Well, he's, he's just a God. We need to realize also before we get into the seven seas, there's no neutral point when it comes to truth. We can't come like people will say, there are many ways to God. That's not the truth. Amen. So we can't come and say, well, that's your way to truth. There's another. There is only one. Everything else is invalid. But the reason when you come to a discussion and argument with people, they want you to put the Bible down. We're not going to use that as evidence. That is our evidence. Amen. If we're to say we can't use the Bible, what are we going to use? We need the facts, and we need the witness. And who is the witness? The one who gave us the Bible. The one who was there from the very beginning. So, when people come and say, we cannot talk with you if you're going to use the Bible, I'm sorry. But if you're going to ask me to discount the Bible, it's not a fair argument or debate. Because you can come with all your facts and all your figures to prove what you're right. We come with our facts and our figures to prove what is the truth? So, and one quick uh, 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 quotation, and uh, this is from Chuck Swindoll, and I've just been going through his book. If you want to buy that, come see me afterwards. I'm joking. Uh, let me just read a couple uh, quick paragraphs for you here. We've got lots of time. Marketing is not a values-neutral language. 
When people market Buddhism, when people market the Muslim faith, guess what? You spend a lot of money on media to make your point. But with the Christian faith, we are not receiving a fair shake when it comes to the media. Marketing unavoidably changes the message. Do you see a lot of uh, uh, these televangelists who change the message that if you send your money to me, we're going to do this and this and this for you? We're changing the message, uh, as all media do. Why? Because marketing is the particular vernacular of a consumerist society in which everything has a price tag. To market something is therefore to effectively make it into a branded product to be consumed. And we market the church at our peril if we are blind to the critical and categorical difference between the truth and truth as you sell it. You get that idea? In a marketing culture, the truth becomes a product. People will encounter it with the same consumerist worldview with which they encounter every other product in American marketplace. Christianity is another product in the marketplace. Well, it doesn't work for me. People will come and tell us. One, and here's the other paragraph. Most people will never intentionally compare Jesus to Coca-Cola or Chevrolet. But in a consumerist society, we run the danger of implying that the good news of Jesus is just one of many similar choices, all of which are equally valid. There is no equally valid truth. There's only one. Just choose your flavor of, of a savior. But Jesus never gave us that option. He claimed that he's the only way to God the Father. In a world that's bound, bound for hell, Jesus' claim isn't selfish exclusivism. It's grace. And that's what people need to see. We, we don't claim to be Christians because of anything other than Jesus Christ came and paid his life on the cross. And he is the truth, the way, and the life. Everything else is a lie. And, you know, we need to be tolerant of other worldviews, but when it comes down to the point, Jesus is the truth. Amen. There is no other Savior. So we're going to go to the seven C's, and we'll go through those at a brick neck, uh, breakneck what did I say before? Breakneck speed. That's what I was going to go. So let's look at the first C, which is creation. We have two choices in creation. Either the Bible tells us the truth, or it's a lie. Amen. There is no, well, we're going to make the Bible fit the, 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 well, no, the, the evolutionist facts that it's over several billions of years. There's only one witness. Well, there's two. God and his son, when we're looking at it that way, who were there at the beginning. There was no evolutionist there. There was no camera. There was no iPhone. There was nothing there. God was the witness. Amen. We don't have to go and say, well, you know, it could have happened over billions of years. When God says seven 24-hour days, guess what we have? If he says seven 24-hour days, that's what it is. It's not, well, seven uh, days, so supposedly seven epochs of millions of years. I, I would rather trust in what God says and how people try to make the, the facts fit for what they believe. Amen. If we abdicate or negotiate our position in the Bible, then the rest is gone. So the first 11 chapters is truth. It's not, well, you know, someone wrote it a long time ago and it was a nice story and they handed it down family to family over the years. No, it's the truth. Amen. So that, that's what we hold to. His promises never fail. So G, uh, Genesis is truth and can be trusted just like Matthew or Mark or any of the New Testament books. The same writer is behind them all. So when we understand that. And Genesis answers the three questions if you want to put that on number one, so number one, if you're looking at yours, it's creation. It's number one. It answers three questions. Number one, how it happened. How it happened. That's what Genesis answer, answers for us. How it happened. Number two, when it happened. When it happened. And then number three, why it happened. 
And you know what? We need to look at why and say God so loved the world that even though he knew we were going to rebel, he loved us enough to let it happen anyway. He could have not said, no, I'm not going to do anything. I know what they're going to do. Forget it. It's not worth the hassle. But God says, I love you so much. I'm going to do it. Amen. At the cost of who? His son. That's what he was willing to do to let us come into this world. Amen, and thank the Lord for that. The second C is corruption. Let's go to Genesis, the second chapter, verses 16 and 17. Genesis 2. Don't let anyone, brethren, tell you that Genesis is not a reliable book. It is. Why? Because God had it in place as a witness. Genesis 2, verses 16 and 17. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat of it, for in the day that you eat thereof you shall surely die. So the second C is what? What is it, kids? Corruption. Mankind corrupted themselves when we rebelled against God. Amen. As soon as we disobeyed God, corruption entered the world. Why? Because God says, the day you eat thereof, you're going to what? We're going to die. That was the spiritual death that we had from God, and the physical death was, uh, it was, uh, hmm, what am I thinking of here? It was, it was going to happen. God said, if you disobey, you're going to die. The, the spiritual death, of course, was right away. And remember what happened when God said to Adam and Eve, where are you? And they said, what? We, saw, we heard your voice and we were going to hide from you. Why? Because of fear. They lost that relationship with him. So evolution teaches that things came out of chaos and are becoming better, right? We're coming into the, uh, the what do you call that there? They call it, uh, every generation is progressing towards this superhuman, towards a super creation, survival of the who? The fittest. That's all a lie because it's the exact opposite. The truth was that there was peace and love and no chaos in the beginning of creation. And what happened when man and, and woman fell? Chaos became part of our lifestyle. So Christianity teaches the opposite. Everything is eroding. Look at Einstein's theory, number two, thermodynamics, right? The second law says that everything is eroding. And there's so much proof of that. Uh, the geneticist, Dr. John Sanford, he's a, a genetic scientist, says that, and I've mentioned that before, the DNA is being damaged so much in each following progressive generation that the mutations are so bad that we are going to become extinct. Men and women will not be able to procreate after a while because of the damage done to the DNA. Does that sound we're getting better and better? <laughs> Maybe to the environmentalist wackos. Yeah, we are because guess what? Man will be off and the animals will be able to take control. The world will be okay again. So that's the problem that we have. You're either going to trust in God or trust in these people who do not know God. Number three is what? What is number three? Catastrophe. Let's go to Genesis 6, verses 5 to 7. Genesis 6, 5 to 7. <clears throat> what is catastrophe? And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. See, and I've brought that message before. The only thoughts that are in us are what? They're corrupted, evil. We cannot think good outside of God. We can't. Now, can men have good ideas about how? But you know what? All of our actions are, what does the Bible say, that all our works are what? Filthy rags. That's the best we can come up with. So, uh, when our thoughts are, are, are bombarded by evil all the time, how are we supposed to live? If we don't come to Jesus Christ, of course we're going to live sinful lives. 
Verse 6, And it repented the Lord that he made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. It still grieves him today. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth. And you know, people look at God and say, what a mean God he is. He is a just God. Sin has to be reckoned with. Right? Both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for repent is me that I have made them. And you think God, that was something simple for him to say? That broke his heart. It broke his heart knowing he was going to have to destroy that beautiful creation that he made. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. That's what I was. People say grace is only found in the New Testament. I see grace right here. I see grace. All right, so the interesting thing. 200 flood narratives all around the world, different cultures, different languages. They all have a flood narrative. Isn't that interesting? Uh, the, the Babylonians, the Chinese, Hawaiian, Grecian, Akkadian, Sumerian, the native tribes of North and South America, uh, tribes from Australia, they all talk about a flood. Now, even though they may have a difference in a man or a family being saved in the animals and what kind of, of uh, uh, ark it was, they all have the same thought from the very beginning. There was a flood. Now, how can we come and say, well, no, uh, I'm sorry, that's all just a bunch of myth. It doesn't make any sense when you've got that many different languages and a lot of them who never knew, never come into contact with, with one another, and there they are. We've got these flood narrative. So they're still holding the idea, uh, the people are, they have to discount a flood because if they say there is a flood, then guess what? Gee, there's something in this that's true. So they have to discount the flood, and they will. There was no flood. That's what they'll tell us. Uh, so confusion, okay, so that was catastrophe. Now we're going to go to confusion number four. Let's go to Genesis verse 11. So if anyone says to you that the Bible's not true, tell them about the flood and say, well, if you discount the flood, then we're going to go through all these 200 different uh, uh, stories about the flood and say, well, then why is this all so similar? Uh, so number four is what? Confusion. Genesis 11, verses 1 to 4. And the whole, the whole earth was one language and of one speech. Uh, I'm going to take a chance here and say it probably wasn't English. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and slime they had for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. And let, and notice it says here, and let us make us a name. Why? Lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the earth. Remember what God told Noah and his family to do? Be fruitful and multiply. And what are they supposed to do? Supposed to go across the whole world. What does mankind do? No, we're not going to do that. Let's make ourselves a name. We're going to build this tower of Babel. And uh, guess what? They wanted to be God. We don't need God. We're going to be God. So that was the problem that they were, de they were dealing with. A, a pride-filled, wicked generation that, that says, we're going to do things our way. So that's why confusion came about. God had to intervene, just like he did with Noah and the ark. God had to intervene just with Adam and Eve. He had to make them skins. He had to shed blood for forgiveness. Put them out of the Garden of Eden. So how did we get all the cultures that we have in the world now? It came from God. God instituted languages. And now we have all these languages that there are today. God intervening on our behalf. Uh, so, and you know, brethren, that's one thing we need to realize with all four points that we start with. Each one of them reveals, other than creation, each one of them reveals the rebellion of mankind. Always in rebellion. And God always trying to clean up the mess we make and try to create a holy people for himself. So then a generation or two later, we see that man is confused uh, and deceived. 
And, and it's the same way it is today. We're in confusion the same way that we were back then. Now we've got transgenderism. What's that all about? Well, I don't know if I'm a man or a woman. That's confusion. When we've got the LGBTQ and all the other little things behind that, that's all confusion. Look at the marriages. Who established marriage? Who were the two first in the marriage? There wasn't uh, something else along the side, was there? But because of confusion, we're going to say, no, we're going to establish marriage. And you know that in California, there are people who have married buildings. There are people who have married animals. There are people who have married trees. Is that marriage? But that's what happens with confusion. We decide what the marriage is. So uh, when you don't know what a marriage is, you can go ahead and do that when it's not biblically based. Let's go to number five now, Christ. I should have said, what was that? <laughs> All right, Christ. Let's go to Luke, the second chapter. We're going to the New Testament now, Luke 2, verses 8 to 13. Now we get the good news. And I'm thankful that these last three points are the most important ones. Christ is point number five on this one. Luke 2, verses 8 to 13. Luke 2, verse 8, And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flocks by night. Uh, like that one child said that they were washing their flocks by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not. Do you know how many hundreds of times that it says fear not when it involves a, a good message? Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a what? That's the good news. Christ the Lord. Hallelujah. Man has rebelled. Man is in such great troubles uh, because of the destruction that is promised against us for our sin. And here we get the Savior. The, the, for the, those uh, points 2, 3, and 4 what a mess we're in. Uh, that's why sometimes when we read, uh, you go to First and Second Kings and into Chronicles, it's just a mess. How many times do we see, and if you go to Judges, uh, there's a generation that rose up, rose up that knew not the Lord, and what were they found doing? Worshipping all these other gods. We've always found ourselves that way. Worshipping things that God says don't worship. Amen. So, we would agree that the world was, and yes, still is in terrible shape, but we found a Savior in Christ the Lord. And I am thankful that He decided we were worthwhile saving. Amen. Let's go to Ephesians 2, verses 11, 13 for that. Ephesians 2. And what did Jesus say in John the 10th chapter? I am come that what? You might have life and might have it more abundantly. And I am thankful that He has given us that life and that we have the truth and we have a spirit to guide us too. So Ephesians 2, 11 to 13. Wherefore remember that you being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at the time you were without Christ, and when we were without Christ, what was their hope? There is no hope without Jesus. Being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. That is what happens when we don't have Jesus, brethren. But now, here's the good news. In Christ Jesus, you who sometimes were far off are made nigh or close by the blood of Christ. And I'm thankful for God for that. Amen. We know the law. The law is in here, but brethren, the law doesn't save us. Knowing Jesus saves us. All right, so let's go to that. Uh, let's go to point number six, which is what? What's the sixth thing? The cross. Okay, let's go to that. John 12, John the 12th chapter, and I'm so thankful that he gave his life. Brethren, we need to make sure that we are living the resurrection life, right? It's not just enough to be saved, and then it becomes a nice story, and it seems to leave our hearts. Brethren, we need to live the resurrection life. 
How do people become saved? When they see Jesus living in your life. Not seeing you, not seeing me, when people see Jesus. And I say amen to that too. John 12, verses 31 to 33. John 12, 31 to 33. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of the world be cast out. Aren't you thankful for that? He was judged and defeated. Hallelujah on the cross. When Jesus said it was finished, the devil was done. In fact, you know what I thought about this the other day? Every nail that they hammered into Jesus was the nail in Satan's coffin. And I thought about that. That makes so much sense. He was the one who was dying on the cross. Jesus was the one who was giving us life. And I thought, this is so awesome. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. This he said, signifying what death he should die. And it says in Hebrews, he gladly went to the cross for us. Hallelujah. And I still like that idea. He hammered Satan to death on the cross. And I like that. So those nails that he used were for someone else's destruction. Remember Pilate standing in front of Jesus and he says, what is truth? He couldn't even see with his own eyes. Here was the word of God right before him, the, the truth himself. And they still, he still couldn't see what truth was. But I'm thankful that Jesus, when he died on the cross, he was going to draw all men unto himself. And I'm so thankful to God for that. Okay, we're on number... Can I find it on my thing here? Here we go. Let's go number seven. What is number seven? What does consummation mean? And don't say consummate being a soup. We're not talking about that. We're talking consummation. Let's go to 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter. And brethren, we have a great hope ahead of us. And what is that? Jesus Christ coming back again. 300 times he has mentioned, I'm coming again. And it's also found in the Old Testament. There is a Savior coming again. And brethren, that is the hope for all of us. Amen. If we dwell on the mistakes we've made, brethren, then there's no hope for us. But we've got a hope, and that's Jesus Christ. Okay. Uh, no, we can go past that. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 to 58. And brethren, there is no mystery anymore. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. There's the consummation. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Isn't that a glorious thing? Hallelujah. We're going to be changed. Brethren, there are so many times we fight with our rotten attitudes and things we do in our life, and we will until Jesus comes again. Because you know what? The old carnal man is still trying to make his presence known in our life, but we have Jesus. We've got to overcome. But the change is coming. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying, It is written, Death is swallowed up in hallelujah. No more death. Our, you know, we all face the fact that we're going to die one day, and who likes to face that? But in the new kingdom, no more death. I'm so thankful to God. What a awesome, uh, just an awesome Savior. The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But you know what? When we're in Christ, there is no law. Why? Because we're living in grace. The law is meant not for a righteous person. The law is meant for who? What are we told in the Scripture? For sinful people. That does not mean we don't keep the law, but you don't have to tell me it's wrong to steal when the Spirit of God and Jesus live in my life. I know that because He lives in my heart. So the law does not matter in that sense to me because He is living in me. Right? Don't say, Pastor Wayne says we don't have to keep the law anymore. I'll be in trouble here. But thanks be to God which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you look at that verb tense, it's active now. It's not in the future we are. Now we are the sons of God, right? Not when Jesus comes again. Now we are. Now we have the victory. 
That's why I was saying, you don't have to tell me not to sin anymore because when Jesus lives in you, you don't want to sin. You don't want to hurt people and you want to worship God. So now, okay, Pastor Wayne, now you made that clear for us. Verse 58, Therefore, my beloved, brethren, be ye steadfast. That means we need to be faithful. We need to be consistent in our lives. Unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Hallelujah. All the things that we have done for the Lord, we are going to be rewarded for. There are works for Christians to do, brethren, not to save us, but to reveal whose servants we are, right? Isaiah 25, verses 6 to 9. We're going to go there with one more scripture after that. So Isaiah 25, verses 6 to 9. I am so thankful that he loves us. And brethren, sometimes we need to hit a roadblock to remind us just how good Jesus is to us. Isaiah 25, verses 6 to 9. Hallelujah. This is an awesome scripture. Isaiah 25, verse 6. And in this mountain shall the Lord of hosts make unto all people, I believe this is the marriage supper of the Lamb being talked about, will make unto all people a feast of fat things, a feast of wines on the lees, of fat things full of marrow, of wines on the lees, well refined. And he will destroy in this mountain the face of the covering cast over all people. That hasn't happened yet. We can't take the scripture and say, oh, this is pointing to something that already happened. Because guess what? People are still blind. In fact, as Christians, we don't see the whole picture either, do we? But it says here, he's going to destroy that. The face of the covering cast over all people and the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death in victory. See, that hasn't happened yet. And the Lord God will wipe away all tears from off their faces. We're still crying today. Am I right? And the rebuke of his people shall he take away from off all the earth, for the Lord has spoken it. What rebuke is that? When you call yourself a Christian, guess what happens? You're picked on. You're made fun of. And then verse 9. And it shall be said, look at this, this is such a beautiful scripture. And it shall be said in that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We have so much good from God given to us. We're going to close with Revelation 22. Revelation, the 22nd chapter. Let's take a quick look at this consummation that is told us in Revelation 22. Revelation 22. You know, brethren, we have so much ahead of us. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. And in the midst of the street of it and on either side of the river was there the tree of life. We're going to see that again, brethren. I believe that. The tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits and yielded her fruit every month and the leaves of the tree for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse. Huh? I like that idea. No more curse. But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. There's some person that said, well, maybe even in the new kingdom, we're not going to see God. This is not what I read here. He will dwell with us. But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face. Do you know that no one's been able to see God's face since Adam and Eve? No one has seen his face. Even Moses couldn't see his face. And his name shall be in their foreheads. And there shall be no night and no need of a candle nor light of the sun for the Lord God gives them light. Remember? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And what happened? There was light. That same light that was there is the same light in the new kingdom. And they shall reign forever and ever. That's the consummation. Father in heaven, we have gone through a lot of struggles in history. 
Man has rebelled against you, Lord, so many times. We have fallen, Lord, short of your glory. But we are thankful that Jesus came and settled it on the cross, that we can have life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Forgiveness of sins and the promises of a future that will be taking place when Jesus comes back again. Thank you, dear Lord God, for those promises. Help that to be a part and joy of the resurrected life that you ask us to live. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.